Hello and welcome to Euro PCR 2025. I'm Chris Cook and I'm delighted to be joined live in the studio with two great contributors to the field of aortic valve disease research. So welcome, Philippe Genero. Welcome, Victoria Delgado. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Philippe, it's hard to think of it, but it's really only six months out since the presentation of the early TAVAR study. Mm -hmm. And it's really challenging all of the paradigms that we hold in place for the treatment and, and management of aortic, uh, asymptomatic aortic stenosis. So can you update us what the latest data was that you presented to us here in Paris? Absolutely. So thanks for the question. Obviously, the early TAVR trial was uh, a large randomized trial of 901 patients randomizing and investigating the early TAVR treatment compared to clinical surveillance for severe aortic stenosis uh, with no symptoms. Just as a recap, we show actually that early intervention was associated with um, lower rate of death stroke and unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization, but also with superiority in terms of death stroke and heart failure hospitalization. So what we look at PCR, we present data about the extent of cardiac damage and the impact of a strategy of early intervention compared to surveillance on the progression or regression of cardiac damage. So the first thing that we did is all those patients at baseline had an echocardiogram and also at two years we paired the patient and we assess how the damage evolved. What we saw first finding is a lot of patients, in spite of being asymptomatic with a normal EF and actually a normal stress test, had 85% at extensive cardiac damage, either like uh, thick LV, uh, LV mass index increases, diastolic dysfunction, large LA, AFib, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the extent of cardiac damage was very frequent among those asymptomatic patients, which make us think that maybe we intervened too late mm -hmm. in the course of the disease, even uh, in the asymptomatic stage. The second finding was a patient with early intervention derived a benefit over clinical surveillance in all strata of cardiac damage, whether the LV, the LA, the RV, or the PA were, were, were injured. And the last, but more, I would say the most important finding is a strategy of early intervention seemed actually to uh, improve the cardiac damage at two years compared to waiting seemed to worsen uh, the extent of cardiac damage. So I believe this is very new data that give us a more granular assessment of what the cost of waiting could be in a structural heart uh, function uh, and, 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 and damage point of view. I mean, to me, it's really humbling data, 85% of seemingly well patients have got cardiac damage. Absolutely. And Victoria, can you expand on that concept of cardiac damage in terms of staging of the disease? So this is a very disruptive uh, concept, if I may, because uh, so far the guidelines has not, have not considered this staging so directly. Uh, we have considered, for example, in asymptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis, whether there is a DBP increase or if we do an exercise test and we induce symptoms or there is a response to the blood pressure that is not appropriate, then the patient would qualify for having uh, intervention. But the staging is something that is available to everyone because it can be done with echocardiography. And then what you evaluate is how many abnormalities on top of the aortic stenosis you have, whether there is a left ventricle that is thick and uh, with a reduced ejection fraction that in this case would have any qual qualified for uh, intervention, but if imagine that has a normal ejection fraction and a mitral regurgitation or left dilatation, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary uh, vasculature affected with pulmonary hypertension and then tricuspid regurgitation and right ventricular failure. So that makes you a little bit more granular evaluation of the patient with asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis because it can tell you, as Philippe said, that probably early TAVR or early intervention is not that early, but early enough to avoid that those changes are not in a point of non-return so that they can be recovered and have a normal structure again. So to me, I mean, there's two key takeaways there. One is that aortic valve disease is not just confined to the valve, okay? It's about, it's a cardiovascular exactly. disease, key point number one. And key point number two is that it seems symptoms, it's just way too late mm. in the disease process to be a, a trigger to act. Yeah. So Philippe, my final question to you then is, Talking and expanding that point, what is the cost of waiting on these patients? And I mean that both clinically and even economically. 
Absolutely. So we presented this morning actually um, new data about 25,000 patients in the U.S. undergoing aortic valve replacement, whether it's TAVR or surgical AVR. And we classified those patients in three groups, whether they had the AVR, whether they were asympt asymptomatic with, with, with no, no uh, symptoms, whether they had their AVR when they had mild symptoms, what we call progressive valve syndrome, class 2 heart failure, or whether they had the AVR while they were an acute bowel syndrome, meaning severe symptom of heart failure, pulmonary edema, some people cardiac arrest, uh, and, and, and class 3 or 4 heart failure. And what we found actually is obviously patients that had acute bowel syndrome or AVS had threefold more time of dying at two years uh, post aortic valve replacement and also fourfold more heart failure rehospitalization. And actually the best outcome obviously was in the group with a stable or asymptomatic patient that had a lower rate of death and a lower rate of re for heart failure. What we look actually, we look also at the economic impact of this. So what we found is treating patients with acute valve syndrome while waiting with severe or serious symptoms cost more than $36,000 at one year compared to patients that are stable and waiting for progressive valve syndrome, so mild symptom, costs twenty-seven thousand dollars more than when patients are asymptomatic. Pointed to the fact that, uh, from a clinical point of view, and from an economical point of view, treating patient with no symptom to prevent the progression to either more cardiac damage, repeat heart failure, hospitalization, seem to be clinical and economically more valuable. Fantastic. I mean, it's just more data, and I mean data to suggest that so-called watchful waiting is potentially not fit for purpose anymore in, in, in this contemporary era. Well, I want to thank you both very much for your insights and also your contributions to the field. Thank you. Thank you so much.